I've had a, I've had a really good time here this weekend meeting a lot of you. It's um, this is a great town. Uh, you know, you're my kind of people. And I'm, you know, I'm really really happy to be here. Uh, Peter was sharing a little bit about the uh, the fourth and the fifth step, and that is so key, I believe, in uh, in being able to identify the causes and conditions of my failure at life. It, it just really is. Uh, I have one story I can tell you about a fifth step. Uh, there was a period of time where I, I was just doing way, way too much sponsoring, if you can do such a thing. I had like 50 guys I was working with, and they were all coming through the house. I mean, you know, at once, and they were all coming through the house. And there was this one guy, I hadn't thought about him in a couple of weeks, and I thought, you know, he owes me a fifth step. So I call him up, I say, get over to my house, bring your fifth step, we're doing it this Saturday. So he shows up at the house, he walks in, and uh, we, go, we go upstairs, and he starts reading, and I start to get this feeling of deja vu, you know, and I realize about three resentments in that he'd already done this fifth step with me, I'd completely forgot, and he's going on and on and on, and I'm thinking, oh my God, so uh, this, is a, this is a program that demands rigorous honesty, so I say to him, I say to him, I go, you know, with cases like yours, I like to do this twice, you know, because uh, I, I, I didn't want to look stupid, and uh, that's not the bad part. He started doing that with all the guys he was working with, so he's doing, he's, this guy's doing double fist steps to this day. Anyway, uh, what can it hurt, I guess, right? But. Uh, Okay, I've, I've recognized that I'm alcoholic and I'm in a real lot of trouble. The whole quality of my life is, uh, is in the toilet. I mean, I, I just can't be happy. Um, I come to believe that there's a power greater than myself that can restore to me to sanity, not only provide the protection uh, from the first drink, but to, vo to provide direction and care in my life. And, uh, the power that I need to be able to really live a really quality life and be able to do the things I want to do. I come to believe in that. After I've come to believe in that, I'm ready to make a decision to seek that. If I can seek that, that, uh, that power, uh, if I can enlist that power, if I can participate with that power, uh, I can be safe and protected from the next drink or drug. I can recover from alcoholism and the problems in my life can start to become solved. I can outgrow my fear. Uh, I can abandon my resentments. Uh, the guilt and remorse and the shame can, be, uh, can, can, can disappear. Depression, anxiety, all that stuff can leave me uh, if, if I uh, make the decision to seek this power. So in, in step three, I make, I make a decision to seek the power. I, I, I make a decision to stop playing God. I make a decision that God is going to be my director, he's going to be the principal, he's going to be the father, and I'm going to have to try to uh, align myself with uh, being directed, being the agent, uh, um, uh, being, the, being the child. And after making that decision, it says we launch into action. We need to launch... It, our decision is going to be meaningless unless, unless at once followed up, up by a course of vigorous action. So we launch into this vigorous action. I, uh, I, I speak sometimes with a guy who's uh, an airline pilot, my friend Doug, and he was explaining the, the term launch to me. I said, Doug, what does launch mean? He goes, launch means going from zero to 200 miles an hour in a matter of feet. You know, So if we're going to launch... Uh, if we're going to immediately and we're going to launch into a vigorous course of action, what does that mean? Does that mean that we can do this step three and then go on vacation to Cancun for a while? No. We're supposed to, ha we're supposed to start writing immediately after we get up off of our knees, basically. That's the way they did it in the day. Um, that's, that's when they had the highest uh, recovery rates. And that's the way I want to do it because um, I'll tell you what. I would like to have a really good recovery rate chance. So um, I start writing, I do my inventory, I do the four column resentment, I do the, the fear inventory, I do the harms to others inventory. I develop a sex ideal by looking at the, um, 
uh, the sex harms on my inventory. You know, it, it basically says that uh, us alcoholics, we're, we're way, way overboard, uh, you know, with our relationships and how, how we view people and how we maneuver and operate. We're like selfish and self-centered, so we get involved in relationships, and it's all about us, and what can we get, and, you know, how can we maneuver, how can we manipulate, how can we get what we want. We'll bring flowers to get what we want, or we'll bring threats, but we're going to try to get what we want. And all of this causes a lot of damage, and we recognize it in the fourth step. And at that point in time, uh, we can also see that these are the things that really caused the problems in our lives. These are the things that blocked us off from God. They're the things that kept us from having effective relationships. They're the things that, that shot us in the foot every single chance we got. You know, we couldn't finish anything. We, you know... We were expecting people to judge us on our, our intentions and not our actions. We were, you know, we were, we were just uh, uh, ill-equipped at life. And we start to recognize all this stuff. So we become willing to have God remove these defects of character so we can have some kind of quality of life. And back in the day, it was written in the original manuscript that we, uh, that we humbly, on our knees, ask God to remove our character defects holding nothing back. So that's, like, that's the way I, I like my guys or anybody I'm working with uh, to do it. There is a depth to steps, uh, steps six and seven that over the course of time in your recovery become more meaningful to you. There's more and more levels to the onion. You know what I mean? Like... It's very possible for you three days after your last drunk to be, you know, finished with step six. Does that, does that mean, you know, your life is going to be perfect? No. There's an evolution to, uh, to your recovery some, sometimes. And uh, I do, I, to this day, I still do a lot, of, uh, a lot of work with step six and seven because things get subtler. Things, things go below the radar. You know, I'm not overtly out there causing disasters. I'm not the tornado roaring through everybody's life. But there are still subtle ways that I manipulate or I try to get what I want or, I, uh, you know, I'm selfish. And, you know, when I recognize those, I inventory them. I ask God to remove, remove these defects of character that are causing me uh, to cause harm in the universe. And over the course of time, uh, you know, uh, this, this has become a, a process for me. And, you know, steps six and seven um, are really an amazing thing. Uh, Bill said that's, this is where we, uh, we separate the, the men from the boys or something in the, in the, in the step book. And I understand a little bit about, uh, about what, he's, what he's saying about that. Now, uh, just to demonstrate a little bit about the subtle levels of, of six and seven, um, I heard somebody offer somebody else this as an exercise. This is an exercise. Go to the five people who know you best and say to them, listen, I'm working on a spiritual course of recovery that's going to help save me from alcoholism, and I need you to be brutally honest with me. Write down every single character defect you see in me. Tell, you know, tell me exactly how I'm wrong. You know, it's anything that you can think of, you know, and just write that down. Would you do that for me, please? No. Now, let me ask you, how many of you are really going to leave here today and go do that exercise? Sometimes we don't even want to know what our character defects are. You know what I'm saying? So there's going to be levels. There's going to be processes that are going to be involved with 6 and 7. But I believe right after inventory, right after sharing the fifth step with someone, you're about as close as you can be to having the defects of character removed that God is going to show you at that period of time anyway. Now, anybody, anybody in here ever make the mistake of taking some time in between steps six and seven to do steps eight and nine? You know, a little, little, little breathing room, you know, a couple of months off. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, I didn't have any instructions in the steps when, when I was first getting sober. Uh, somebody would raise their hand in a meeting and say, just how do you do a fourth step? And, and some old timer would go, kid, you do a fourth step with a pencil. <laughs> well, 
thanks for that. You know, I, I, I learned a little bit down the road that they didn't know how to do a four-step either. You know, that's why they would say something so stupid. But anyway, uh, there wasn't a lot of, of, of instruction. There was nobody riding me through the steps. So, you know, I was listening to tapes and, you know, I was, I was doing this, that, and that. And uh, I got to a point where I had done my fifth step. I mean, I felt like I was a part of AA now. I'm a card-carrying AA member. And, uh, you know, I felt comfortable in the meetings, and I started to have a spiritual experience. And I thought, now's the time to work on my character defects. Anybody in here ever work on your character defects? Yourself? You're going you're gonna to remove your character defects? It's ugly, isn't it? You ever see that game, Whack-A-Mole? You know, where you take the mallet and you, you, you slam it down on the mole's head and then another mole pops up and you try to get that one and another mole. Well, that, that was me trying to work on my character defects. If you're trying to remove your character defects, I'm telling you right now, you're whacking the mole. Okay? And if you whack the mole too much, you know what happens? You go blind. Now... So I'm telling you right now, don't do it. It's not pretty, okay? Um, let me tell you. Let me tell you the best. Let me tell you the best atmosphere for uh, for the removal of your character defects. The best atmosphere you can be in for the removal of your character defects is becoming willing to make amends where those character defects have harmed other people, and then go out and directly make amends and try to set right the wrongs that you have caused. You can do that. You can't wish away your, your character defects, but what you can do is you can take responsibility for them. So by taking responsibility for them, you're in the best possible spiritual climate for the removal of your character defects. If you haven't gone out and made amends and your life is still a mess, don't look at the surprise on my face. It won't be there. You know what I'm saying? Um, I've got some experience with, uh, with, with the eighth and the ninth step. Here's, here's how I do it. And I'm not a slave to, uh, to the mechanics. If you want to write a list, that's fine. What I do is I do them on index cards. And I'll write down on the, on the first part of the index card the person I harmed and the harm that I'm clear on. And I try to be very specific about the harm. You know, I, I try to real. it's got to be the truth, exactly what I did. And, you know, I'll put the person's name, and, and then what, what I usually use is I'll use a plus and a minus. A lot of times when you're assembling your amends, you feel diffident about going to these people. In other words, you're, you're a little scared about actually going and making direct amends. You don't feel like you have the power, the spiritual fortitude right at that minute to go out and make amends. Some of these amends are scary. Some of them might cause problems. Some of them you need to discuss them with somebody. But if I don't feel comfortable right that minute going to the make the amends, I put a minus. If I feel like I can make that amends right now, I'm clear on it, I'll go, you know, today, whatever, I'll put a plus. Okay, so I'll assemble these cards. Usually, I'll sit with a sponsor or a spiritual advisor, let them know what the harm is, and get some feedback on the approach and what the amends should look like. Now, this is another thing that, you know, when you're out there making amends, all kinds of things can happen. It can end up not going the way you want it to. Nine chances out of ten, though, it ends up going better than you think it will. But I want to be clear a little bit on how I could, how I could offer to set right those wrongs. And I'll put that on the back of the card. Now, our book, our book is very, very clear on, uh, on the amends process for criminal amends. It's pretty clear on the man we hated. It's pretty clear on if we've stepped out on the misses. You know, I know that nobody in here has ever done such a thing like that, but it covers that topic, okay? Dom domestic troubles, troubles with the family. There's very, very few amends that there aren't instructions in our book. And, and, and it's, it's a good idea to get clear on, uh, on those instructions prior to making amends. But let's say I've made my list and I have my stack. You know, if it's your first amends stack, I've seen anywhere from 20 to 150 amends. It usually doesn't go, f go further up than that. 
Um, there's a men's cards for people that you, you can't see anymore. They could be one-night stands or they could be somebody you robbed and you don't even know who they were. Uh, there can be a lot of amends like that, but you have, you have a stack of cards about Ye Bing. Now, um, nothing will put muscle in your recovery more than step nine. Step nine is a transformational experience. But here's what you think before you go into step nine. Oh my God, I can't do that. This will happen. Or that will happen. Or I'll look like a jerk. Or they'll tell everybody. I mean, your ego is going to come up with every excuse in the world to not do this step. It's going to be a battle between your spirit and your ego. And you know what? You're going to need every bit of enthusiasm, every bit of support you can get from your sponsors or the people that you're working with to get through this process. Because it's not easy. It takes a lot of courage. Courage is walking through fear. Being afraid and doing it anyway. You know what I mean? And I'm telling you, alcoholics are courageous people. I, I have seen the most amazing uh, amends that, that you can even imagine done. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I sponsor, I sponsor a guy who, uh, uh, who was on his way to a rehab, drunk, crossed the double yellow and hit a nurse coming out of the rehab head on and killed her. You know, and I've seen this guy get free, he did his time, he did the best kinds of amends he could do. I mean, I've seen some courageous amends in my day. Um, don't shortchange yourself from this experience. It's the most transformational experience in the 12-step process. And it's the, one, it's the ones that so many people in Alcoholics Anonymous today will try to talk you out of. And they're going to try to talk you out of it because they didn't do it, and they don't want you to be a better AA member than them or some crazy crap like that. So go to people with experience to help you get through this. One of the things that I found very, very helpful was a steel-on-steel -steel format. Um, there's some people that can explain that to you if you want, but basically what it is, it's a tight little support group. It's like you meet in, you, there's maybe five friends or something that meet in their house once a month and just get current with where they are in the program. Just, hey, tell me where you are in, 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 the, uh, in the three areas of the triangle. Tell me how you're doing with your meetings. Tell me how you're doing in your recovery process. Tell me how, what you're doing in service. And everybody gets current with each other. And we keep each other honest about this process. And, and it's, a, it's a very challenging format for amends because uh, in a lot of the steel on steels I would do, I would go, okay, everybody, on the table, an unfinished amends. Put it on the table. I know you guys got one. And everybody would come up with an amends that they were supposed to make. And we would challenge each other. The next time we meet, we want to hear about how that amends went. You need every bit of encouragement you can get to do this. Because, again, it's so damaging to the ego. It, it's, it, it's so damaging. to the, the ego does not want you to do it. Every bit of your alcoholism will be crying out, no, I can't go there. I won't do that with that person. You know? Uh, I mean, I... I sponsored, I sponsored a guy who someone uh, sexually abused his daughter who was 14 or something. And, I mean, he, he beat the crap out of this guy. He had him prosecuted because it was a, a, a friend of the family. And he had this anger inside him about this. This guy did this to my daughter. And he, he fuming about it. And he came to me with his cards. And he goes, listen, Chris, I'm telling you right now telling you right now, there's a card in there, and I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. It's, I am never making amends to this. Do you know what this guy did? I am never making amends to this bastard. I don't care what you say. You, I don't even know why I wrote the card. I said, I guess that's a minus then, you know? <laughs> and he goes, you're damn right it's a minus. Now, here's what, here's what happened. He had a stack about that high. He got all the way down to the last card. And it was this guy. And he came to me and he goes, oh, I, I got to do it. I can't believe I'm at this point. I can't believe I'm asking you this, but how the hell am I going to do this? You know? And, and we worked it out. He actually met with the guy at a diner. And he made amends for his part. You know what his part was? The hate that he had for this guy. 
I mean, he went after this guy with a vengeance, and he needed to get free of that. It was burning him up. It was corroding his spiritual condition. It was corroding his spiritual condition. You know, we get a daily reprieve from, from, from alcohol based on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. If there's something corroding our spiritual condition, important warning sign. You know what I mean? Your, your, your sobriety could be in peril. So he did this. He got done. He was finished with amends. I, I have never seen a transformation like that in my life. He's worked with hundreds of alcoholics. He gets them through amends. He's carrying the message all over the place, and his life is on fire with, with quality and spirituality. And he, he's, he's one of the happiest guys I've ever seen in my life. He went from being a resentful, pissed-off alcoholic to just being like this this love Buddha guy, you know? I mean, it was just, a, just an unbelievable transformation, you know? He, and and uh, everybody goes to him. He's everybody's spiritual advisor. I want what he has, you know what I mean? And, uh, and that kind of transformation is possible. Now, Peter talked about this a little bit before. There is opinions and there's experience. If you have not finished your amends, don't come up and want to talk to me about you don't have to or this is why you shouldn't or isn't that silly. You're going to be giving me an opinion based on an experience you've not had. Get to the other side of amends. Finish them to the best of your ability. Some people can't be seen. Some people can't be approached because it will cause more harm and suffering. I understand all that. But when you're working with someone who's got experience with these steps, go as far as you absolutely can. When you get to the other side, then come talk to me about what the experience is like completing every single amends you're consciously aware of at this point in time. There is a new freedom and a new happiness that you have no idea you could have access to. How about the removal of fear? How about being able to go anywhere, anytime, not worrying about seeing anybody? I mean, alcoholics, the, the, the damage we do going through life, you know, we're like a tornado. I mean, we, you know, we've hurt neighbors and we, we've, we've hurt lovers and, we, you know, we've hurt family and we've hurt employers. How about if you've gone to every single one of them, and this is how I suggest it's done, Except maybe in money and men. Sometimes you just pay the money back. But this is, this is how I suggest to my guys to do it. Because this is how I've found through my own experience is the best way. There's three questions that's very, that are very, very important to ask. When you're facing somebody, you, you, know, you, go, you get clear on, here's the harm I've caused you. I was wrong. You don't say you're sorry. You say you're wrong. I was, you know, I did a, I was wrong. You know, I caused these harms. And then when you get done with that, there's three questions that I find very, very helpful. One of them is, have I left anything out? Are there any other harms on, I'm unclear on that I've caused you? And then shut up. Because they'll usually tell you. Okay? After they've told you, okay. Another question is, do you, need, do you need to talk about this? Do you need to tell me how it made you feel? Do we need to discuss any of this further? And then shut up and listen, and they'll tell you. They'll tell you, usually. And then the third and most important question is, what would you have me do to set right this wrong? What would you have me do to set right this wrong? And then if it's, if it's, if it's ethical, if it's legal, if it's moral, if it's appropriate, and if it's possible, do it, whatever that is. And then you've completed the amends. Most of the time, they don't give you a laundry list of stuff, they'll say, oh, listen, oh, this is just great that you're here, you know, I'm really impressed, and, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. If they tell you to keep doing what you're doing, then keep doing what you're doing. If they tell you just stay sober, then just stay sober. That's how you complete the amends, all right? Um, I had this guy, he was training for, to be an alcoholism counselor, and he was in his master's program. And I get, I get asked to speak every once in a while at, at colleges and stuff like that. And my main topic is spiritual recovery. A lot of people that are in uh, uh, MSW programs, you know, there's not really a course spiritual recovery. 
they teach you a, a whole lot of stuff, and they don't teach very much on spiritual recovery, but it's important because there are periods of time when those counselors are not going to be able to help you, when, those, when, the, when the clinical psychologists are not going to be able to help you. And it's important for them to understand what Alcoholics Anonymous is, what the 12 steps really is. It's a spiritual recovery program. So I'll, I gave this one talk, and this guy came, guy followed me out, uh, out into the hallway, and he's, he's giving me a hard time. He's going, well, what about shame? You know, don't you have to learn to live with shame? And I'm like, no. And he goes, well, how can that be? I, I don't understand. There's got to be a way that you can deal with your shame. And I go, no, no, not, I, I don't deal with any shame. And he's looking really confused. And I ask him this question. I go, listen. Have you, have you ever, have you ever um, listed out all the people that you have harmed in your life? And he goes, no. And I go, so then you've never directly made amends to those people and asked them what you needed to do to set right those wrongs? And he goes, no. I go, then how do you know if you're going to have to deal with shame or not? You're giving me an opinion based on an experience you've never had. And he walked away real confused and headed out to counsel all of us, you know, for the next 20 years or something, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but, but anyway, don't cheat yourself. Get to the other side of amends. Don't hastily run out there, you know, get some, get some guidance from some people with some experience because you can actually cause harm making amends that you're going to have to go back and make more amends for which is, you know, not something that you want to do. Now, this thought uh, brings us to step 10. The way I view step 10 is step 10 is my operational step. It's, it's my reactive step. How do I react out there in the world? I've been given a bunch of spiritual exercises. I've been given a bunch of spiritual principles that I'm supposed to find guiding. I'm supposed to use them in my life as tools to be able to get along with uh, myself, my fellow man, and God. In step 10, uh, it tells us to continue uh, to use personal inventory, to share things, to make amends when we're wrong, uh, you know, to work with another alcoholic, pray, meditate. It basically gives us a laundry list of all of the steps put together. And it's offering this as a walking around reactive step. How are you going to react tomorrow when the boss lays you off? How, how are you going to react when somebody loses their mind and starts yelling at you? How are you going to react when somebody rear-ends you, you know, at a stoplight? All of these things, uh, we don't stop making mistakes just because we get sober and go through the steps. In word, thought, and deed, every single day we're going to fall short. Falling short isn't what's going to get you drunk. Making those mistakes isn't what's going to deteriorate your spiritual condition. How you, how you use the program of recovery is how you're going to make sure your spiritual condition is not going to deteriorate. It's going to help you to keep things from building up in your life. Now, I'm someone who promotes multiple runs through the steps. It's been my experience that uh, every couple of years going through the steps once a year, once every six months, whatever you need, you go through the steps. And what I've found by doing that is I've found that I find a lot of stuff on the fourth step. I find a lot of stuff on the eighth step that I've missed in the tenth step. But my list is a lot shorter these days. When I go through the steps, it doesn't take me long. I don't have a big inventory. I don't have a whole bunch of immense cards. It's a, it's a few. And it's because of my ability to use step 10 as a tool to keep my spiritual life in the best possible way that I, I can. But you're going to miss stuff. It says in the step book, um, many of us go in for annual or an semi-annual house cleanings. That's a, a quote right out of the 12 and 12. What does that mean? What's a house cleaning? I believe a house cleaning is steps four through nine is what a house cleaning is. Get your, get your spiritual life in order. We aren't good at walking around with a lot of unresolved stuff in our lives. Alcoholics, it, it interferes with our sobriety. It interferes with, uh, with the way we feel about ourselves. 
we do much better not having any outstanding problems out there. Okay? Uh, when I walked in, I probably owed 100 amends, and you know I'd caused all kinds of harm. I was afraid to walk up my street. I was afraid to go to the supermarket because I'd bump into somebody. I mean, I had so much, so much stuff going on. I, I just couldn't. You know, I'm trying to get sober. You know, I, I, it was, it, it was, it was rough. And today, today, you know, I can go anywhere. Um, I don't care who's there. Uh, I don't. I'm, I'm not expecting any surprises out of the past. Uh, Fear really, I really have outgrown the fear of people. And that's a big thing. That's a really good thing. It allows me to do a lot of things in my life that I otherwise would have, would, would have been too anxious uh, uh, or, or have, have way, way too much anxiety to be able to do. So there's a freedom. There's absolutely a freedom uh, that you can get through this process. So step 10, keep your side of the street as clean as possible. Keep your spiritual condition as clean as possible. Um, where do we go from here? There's a, one thing I, hear, I heard early on that still makes sense to me today is the steps are in order for a reason. Each step gives you the power to do the succeeding step. If you're sitting in this meeting right now and you're thinking about what I had talked about on amends, oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm going to have to do this or they're going to expect me to do that. Let me tell you right now, if, if, you're not, if you haven't done step one through step eight, you don't have the power for step nine. You know? Don't worry about thinking that you can't do it now. Each step gives you the power to do the succeeding step. So they're in order for a reason. All right, you're up, you're up through step nine, step ten. You're living in the day with step ten. You're in the moment with step ten. What is really going to help uh, to, to uh, maintain and improve and perfect your spiritual life and your spiritual condition? Prayer and meditation. Prayer and meditation have been known for a gazillion years to be very, very beneficial to all of us. It's, it's important for us to do these disciplines. If you don't pray and you don't meditate, you're, you're missing out on something. If you've got a problem with God, pray and meditate anyway. You know, you know what I mean? Just do it. And after a while, uh, you're going to start to see the benefits from it. But there's three basic parts to step 11. There's upon awakening. There's as we move through the day. And then, the, then there's when we retire at night. Okay? Those are three basic disciplines. Uh, upon awakening, we look at the day. Here's basically what I do. I, I have a... I have a prayer ritual that I do every day just to kind of get me centered. Um, and then I, go into, then I go into meditation. And I've got to tell you, I, uh, I would, I would much, it would be much easier for me to walk out outside my house without my pants on than to leave the house before I do my prayer and meditation. It's become such a habit to me that I've got to stop everything I'm doing. If I realize, oh my God, I forgot to do the prayer and meditation, which doesn't happen anymore, but it used to, I've got to pull over. You know what I mean? I mean, it's, I've got to bring God into my day. I've got to bring God into my day. The power has to be in me at all times. I need to be present to the power that's operating in my life. I, I just do. I just do. It, that's the power that's keeping me separated from booze. That's the power that's, that's helped me recreate my life. That's the power that's helped me relieve me of the bondage of my character defects. That's the power that has enabled all of the positive things in my life. I enabled all the negative things in my life. So without, uh, without becoming awake and aware to that power in the morning, it's very, very difficult for me to feel comfortable throughout the day. One of the early lessons that my sponsor told me, he goes, Chris, you, you know, I want you to pray in the morning and I want you to sit in the silence. And there's going to be days when you forget to do that. I want you to pay attention to the days when you forget and the days when you do it. And just compare those days. <clears throat> it took me like a month to realize my days go terrible if I forget to pray and meditate. And they're pretty much decent when I do. So it became, it became a habit. It became a habit with me uh, to do that. 
as we move through the day, there's a lot of disciplines. I'm not going to go through them all. Re, you know, read your own big book on this. But uh, there's practices like, uh, like, like to watch for selfishness, to watch for dishonesty. When these crop up, we ask God at once to remove them. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of spiritual directives in as we move through the day. And as we move through the day is directly related to step 10 too. How do we react out there when we're in the middle of, of uh, uh, you know, when all hell is breaking loose? Like, most of us can be spiritual and everything's fine. But let a lot of, a lot of stuff go on, you know, ha- go to a family reunion or, you know, have people show up at your house to stay for a week that you, you weren't expecting. And there's a lot of things that happen to us. How, how spiritual are you then, you know? Uh, and listen, it's, it's not about, you know, this isn't, this isn't a graded program. You don't get A's, B's, and C's. It's a pass-fail. You, you know what I'm saying? You need, to do, you need to do what you can do. You need to put as much effort as you can put in. And as I walk through the day, I need to be aware, awake and aware of the spirit inside me. Awake and aware of the way I need to live my life in a spiritual manner. And I need to do that to the best of my ability. Again, over the course of time, you know, I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking 18 years of this uh, for me. I've gotten better and better. There's an evolution to your recovery. But you need, to get, you need to get on the path. Today, I cause very little harm in the universe. I, re- I really do. I cause very little harm in the universe. But it wasn't long ago when I was causing a lot of harm. Uh, you know, when... Uh, the, it, uh, one of the things that I, I found very, very difficult to deal with for many years was judgmentalism. Man, I was judgmental. I, that meeting over there, that person sharing over here, oh, no, the, their hand is going up again. Or my boss, my boss was always a jerk. You know, the, the, the cops were always after me. You know, the wrong political party's in. You know, the economy's going to hell. You know, and, and I, I was wrapped up, I was wrapped up in a, in a very negative worldview. And over the course of time practicing these spiritual principles, here, here's basically what's happened. I've gone from a worldview built on fear to a worldview built on love and service. It's been a shift in perception. You know what a miracle is? A miracle is a shift in perception. It's seeing something differently. It's seeing something with a new pair of glasses. You know, what you used to just drive you crazy, now it doesn't bother you at all. When when you when you see somebody who's who's acting out and and outrageous in a meeting, you know, and you used to think that they shouldn't be there, now you're seeing there's somebody that needs some help. You know, it's a shift in perception. You're seeing things differently. All right. This comes from constant attention, I believe, to the step eleven disciplines. Now, um, when we retire at night, we constructively review our day. Constructively is an operative word. We want to get better. We don't want to beat ourselves up. We don't want to sit in self-pity and say to ourselves, oh, I'm never going to get better. I do this all the time. You know, don't worry about that. Just recognize, recognize some of the mistakes you've done. Recognize some of the good things you've done. But recognize some of the mistakes that you've done. Uh, and a lot of times, this is, it's good to do this by writing, okay? I, I'm not going to tell you that I write every night doing my 11th step. But if something comes up that I need to pay attention to tomorrow, if I need to make an amends tomorrow, if I need to set right something, if I've lied to somebody, if, if I've misrepresented a situation to somebody, and, it, and I catch it in my 11th step, there's a reason I'm catching it in my 11th step. I ne- it needs to be dealt with. And I'll do a 10-step amends or something like that the next day or whatever. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn how to live a spiritual life to the best of our ability. And we're enlisting God's aid in every way we can to help us get there. Because the spiritual life is not for everybody. It is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a narrow, uh, it's a narrow path. And it takes a lot, of, uh, a lot of effort, a lot of discipline, a, a lot of enthusiasm, and a lot of support uh, from a higher power. All right, I'm going to move into step 12. Um, 
having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these 12 steps. All right, what does that say? What does that mean? Having had an awakened spirit as a result of the course of action from steps 1 through 11. I don't believe you can have a spiritual awakening as the result of steps you haven't taken. Now, I do a, I do a lot of uh, work, you know, in beginner's meetings and, and rehabs and detoxes, and every once in a while somebody raises their hand and says, I had my spiritual awakening out on the stool out there with Harry. I'm like, you're, you're talking about a spiritual experience. A spiritual experience is, that, is a one-shot. It's like we've all had spiritual experiences. If you did any LSD, you probably had some. You know what I mean? We've all had spirit... But the spiritual experience is something that's not going to last very long. It's like a shot in the arm. It's like seeing that beautiful sunset, you know, or the, the perfect day. You know, we've, all, we've all had those. Spiritual awakening is an awakening. Our spirit has been asleep. Our ego has been running the show, and our spirit has been asleep. So once you get through with your amends, you've done some work with, you're, you're learning how to operate in step 10 and as we move through the day, and you're doing your disciplines of prayer and meditation morning and evening, you've got an awakened spirit. You've got a new perspective, a new outlook on life. You see things differently. You operate differently. Your relationships are different. You react differently in almost all situations. Okay, You've had a spiritual awakening as the result of the 12 steps. If you haven't done the 12 steps, you can't carry the message to another alcoholic. Because it says, having had the spiritual awakening as the result of the 12 steps, we tried to carry this message to other alcoholics. What message? What kind of a message are you bringing if you haven't gotten through the 12 steps? I say, I say it like this. Um, you can carry the alcoholic to the message, or you can carry the message to the alcoholic. If you haven't had a spiritual awakening, that doesn't mean you can't do, still do 12-step work, but really all you can do is encourage somebody to not drink. It's all you can really do. If you haven't had a spiritual awakening, you're just encouraging somebody to not drink. If you've had a spiritual awakening, you can carry the message of that spiritual awakening to somebody and show them how to get free. There's a big difference between encouraging somebody not to drink and offering them the freedom from the bondage of alcoholism. It's like the difference between night and day. All right, so if you owe it to yourself, if you are sponsoring and you still have some amends or you haven't done this step or you haven't done that step, do them. Do them. You owe it to the people that you sponsor. Uh, if, you don't, if you haven't sponsored anybody and you're not going through the steps, at least wait you know, until you're you know, halfway through your amends and you've got, you've got something to share. Okay, because this is not about encouraging people to not drink. We already know that doesn't work. Did, did, did frothy emotional appeal ever work for you? You know, will you please not drink? I promise. I promise I'm not drinking again. You're, you're drunk in two days. Does, does encouragement ever really work to solve the problem. You know? I'm not saying it's bad to not encourage people. We do it in the fellowship all the time. Keep coming back. You know? keep, just keep coming. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow night over at the other meeting. You know? Oh, there's a good meeting on Thursday. I mean, we encourage people. We encourage people to keep coming to the meetings. Absolutely. We encourage them to stay in the AA process because it's, it's in the fellowship that you discover the program. You know, you discover the program of recovery usually in the fellowship. So it's a good idea to keep people in the fellowship. But we all know that that's not, that does not solve the problem over the long haul. So as a sponsor, you've gone through the steps. Um, and you're now trying to carry that message. There's a lot of people that I've met this weekend that are right there. Uh, they're on fire. They've had the spiritual awakening. You know, you, know, you can hear God talking through them. You know, they're enthusiastic. Uh, you know, it uh, seems like the problems in their lives are almost meaningless. They're, they're about the job of working with other alcoholics. And that's like the most important thing in their life. You get to that point, and then you're an adequate sponsor. There's a, I don't have this memorized, but there's something that Bill wrote. I don't even remember where it was, but 
it says uh, uh, the primary obligation of a, a sponsor is the adequate presentation of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I'm, I'm getting it wrong, but that's basically what Bill said. So as a sponsor, your main job is an adequate presentation of the 12 steps to your prospect. And to really do that, you need the experience of it. Remember, this isn't an intellectual process. You don't read the steps and, okay, I got it. You experience the steps. You, you take the spiritual exercises of the steps and you have an experience, and then you can carry the message of that experience to somebody else. And sometimes an experience is a difficult thing to convey. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm trying to talk to a newcomer and I'm trying to describe a spiritual awakening to them, and they're like, it gets better. You know, sometimes it's the best I can say. Or you won't feel bad anymore. Or, you know, it's hard, to it's hard to describe the spiritual waking because it's an experience. But that's the treatment for alcoholism. The spiritual experience is the treatment for alcoholism. If you came to AA and you drank, and you came to AA and you drank, and you go back out, don't tell people AA didn't work. Until you get through those and start sponsoring other people or taking other people through the steps, you haven't participated in AA. Alcoholics Anonymous is a 12-step fellowship. And today, you, know, you can still find people in the fellowship. Well, have you gone through the steps? Well, not formally. You're in a 12-step fellowship. What are, you, what, what are you doing? You know what I mean? I mean, I, I heard it described like this. <clears throat> How about a whole bunch of people who go to an airport and sit in the terminal and talk about flying once a week? Okay. Yeah, you know, it really would be something to go to Albuquerque, you know, and can't wait to get to Tuscaloosa. And they never get on a plane. But there's people going right past them down a the gangplank and they're getting on the plane and they're, they're flying. Who would you rather be hanging out with, you know, if you really wanted to know about flying? Get on the plane, you know what I mean? Don't sit in the terminal talking about what it would be like to fly. Don't sit in AA meetings talking about what it would like, be like to be recovered. Get on the plane, you know what I mean? Get involved with the book. Get involved with somebody who has experience in this. Um, the absolute brightest spot in my life today are the guys that I sponsor. I got a crew, let me tell you. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't sponsor as many people as I used to, uh, but here's, here's basically how I do it. Um, they say, Chris, would you sponsor me? I, you know, I need to know a little bit more about what's going on before I say yes. I don't just say yes. You know, I need to know, why are you asking me? Uh, where are you in the recovery process? Uh, you know, do you know what an alcoholic is? I mean, I've, I've got some questions for you, but all right, let's say I've qualified somebody and they're a prospect, okay? I'll get them over to my house and I'll make sure they're clear on the first step. I'll make sure they're clear on the second step. I'll make sure they understand what the third step decision is. And I'll get them writing inventory. And it's my job to get them through the process. It's not my job to be the drama coach. When I was first coming around, I got a lot of sponsees. I learned right away how to, how to give good share. You know what I mean? How to give good share in meetings. Oh, oh, oh you know, and just share, 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 share. Talk, talk, share, share. And, I, you know, I was doing that. So people were coming up to me and saying, would you sponsor me? You sound really good. And I was, you know, I wasn't. My life was completely unmanageable still. But I started sponsoring them, and they'd call me. And it would be like, blah, 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 you know, an hour on the phone. And what it, what it was was it was recycling the dysfunction in their life. Re, you know, recycling the drama and the dysfunction and just giving me an update on it every day. Okay? You know, it was, it was just that, you know, I, I can't do that. I can't do that. And I'll explain to them. I'll say it like this. Would, would you rather I spend the hour on the phone with you, you know, regurgitating all these problems or would you rather spend the hour on a solution that'll get you past those problems. You, I, I, I want to get you past even needing a drama coach. You know, and I will spend the time getting somebody through the steps. Now, there's an evolution in sponsorship. Uh, 
here's what the big book says. It, the big book says there's, a, pro, there's a, a prospect. That's somebody who needs Alcoholics Anonymous, needs the 12 steps. They're dying of alcoholism. Once you've landed them, they're now your protege. Okay, so the protege is the guy going through the steps. You get them to the other sides of the steps, and then you know what they are? They're your friend. Those are the three descriptives in the book Alcoholics Anonymous about the person that you work with. So I've got a lot of friends today. Now, does everybody make it through the steps? I've got probably a higher percentage rate than most because people know if they ask Chris, you know, it's going to, you know, you're going to have to do the steps. So mo most people that ask me at least know that much about me and, you know, they're at least willing at that point in time to go through the steps. So I've probably got a 75% recovery rate for the people that ask me to sponsor them. 75% the of them are out there. They're AA members in good standing. They're working with other people. They've gone through the steps. They've got service commitments and they're doing their job in Alcoholics Anonymous. But there's always people who, you know, balk. They, 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 so they lose momentum. One of the things that you don't want to lose when you're working with somebody is momentum. I believe in getting somebody through the steps initially fast. Okay? Fast. Now, why is because you lose momentum. If you, if, if you take too much time between steps three and steps four, it takes you six months to write inventory. If, you know, if you take a whole bunch of time in between inventory and doing your A-step cards, you, you lose all kinds of momentum and you just can't pick it back up. You're stalled out. You almost have to go back to square one. This happens a lot. But if you have somebody, you're concentrating on the process, and you're encouraging them, and you're moving them, and you're motivating, uh, you can usually do this pretty quickly. Uh, a guy came over from, from Denmark two weeks ago to visit my house. He was in a very, very black place, very black place. He'd been in AA for three years. You know, uh, a lot of things weren't going his way, and you know, I really, I pictured him, um, I pictured him as somebody who's, who's uh, uh, likely to drink. So we invited him over to our house, and in, in three days, he had his amends cards, and he was ready to fly back to Denmark. He stayed a little bit extra time, but when he got back to Denmark, the first thing he did was he started knocking out the amends. He's a changed man. This is a... This is in, you know, with maybe 16 hours worth of work. This is a changed man. Absolutely a different person. You wouldn't even recognize him. That's the power of this process. This process, this process is unbelievable when you really get down and get involved in it. Now, uh, where do you find people to take through the steps? You find them where you can find the most sick and suffering alcoholics in the world. You find them at AA meetings. Okay? There are so many people who are still sick and still suffering in AA meetings because they have not made it from step one to step 12. And they're still churning around in their dysfunction. They're still updating you on the drama du jour that's going on in their life at every closed-minded discussion meeting you go to. You know what I mean? That's where you can find a lot of them. Get some, re get some rehab commitments. Get some detox commitments. Get involved in carrying the message however you can carry it. It's important for your own sobriety to be carrying this message. I have never se I've seen thousands of people in AA. I've never, ever seen somebody who's consistent with meetings, has gone through the steps with a sponsor as completely as they could, and then pays a lot of attention to 10 and 11 and goes through them again whenever they need to, and who is sponsoring other people and working with other people. I've never seen one of those people, people drink. Never. Never in my life has somebody who's consistent with that process ever drank around me. They've always fallen short somewhere. They've fallen short on working with others, usually. They've fallen short with the step process, or they've fallen short with meetings. But usually it's working with others. So... So it's important, it, you know, this is a progressively fatal illness. The, the treatment and solution for this illness is consistent meetings, going through those steps, and then carrying that message to others. Simple. You want to participate in that? You want to, you, you want to be safe and protected from alcohol? You want the problem to be removed? You want your quality of life to start going up instead of down? Pay attention to this stuff. 
Pay attention to this stuff. You know, it's insane what goes on in Alcoholics Anonymous. Like, if you were suffering from pancreatic cancer and a doctor comes to you and says, well, it's hopeless, you know, you've only got a short time to live, it's progressively fatal, everything's going to get worse. Well, doc, is there nothing I can do? Well, there's this new 12-step procedure out in Minneapolis that they've seen that almost everybody that's gotten involved with it has recovered you would sell your house, you'd sell your family, you'd quit your job, and you'd go to Minneapolis for that process, wouldn't you? You would, because it, if you knew of something that would save your life, you would be gone. But there's a lack of enthusiasm in unrecovered alcoholics, because inherent in alcoholism is an inability to really see how much trouble you're in. You know, so I'll get somebody to come up to me, I mean, his world is on fire. He's got summonses in his back pocket. You know, he's thrown out on the street. You know, oh, will you help me? Will you help me? And I'll say something like, okay, come on over to my house on Thursday night and we'll start working on step one. Oh, Thursday. That's a bad night for me. You know, I've got badminton practice on Thursday. Okay, okay, how about next week? How about next Monday? Oh, Monday's no good, man. I, I tour with the dead this year, and I'm going to be on tour with the dead for two months. On tour, the, you're going to be dead, you know? And they, they just can't see the enormity of their problem. So you have to develop a method of trying to get through to these people, trying to encourage them, trying to carry the message. You have to practice this to get good at it. You got to practice the 12 step to get good at it. So let's all do our jobs in Alcoholics Anonymous. You, you want to know why? Because we're going to be safe and protected. Our life is going to get great. And you know, there's 200 promises in the book that'll come true. So let's, let's try our best today to do our job in Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to I thank everybody uh, who had a part in this. Um, it was really a blast coming out here. Uh, Dustin Kelly, everybody that I've met, it's, it's, um, it's been a really good experience for me. Get involved in recovery. That's all I can say. Thanks. Thank